British Museum and we're looking at the head of Augustus from about 27 or 25 BC. So, who's Augustus? Well, Augustus, of course, became the first emperor. He, of course, was part of the triumvirate. So lots of people know the story of Mark Antony and Cleopatra through Shakespeare, etc. And, of course, he defeated Antony at the Battle of Actium, mm. and that was when he was able to assume right. position. He didn't become Augustus till later on, when the, he finally defeated all the other rivals. So he goes from being Octavian, who's one of three in charge of Rome, to defeating his rivals, including Antony, and... He's given the name Augustus. Yeah. It's an honour that, that the Senate give to him. And then with that, it's a shift. He's saying, well, this is a change from the past now. He can't do the same kind of promoting himself in the ways he had before in battle, struggling against the other people that wanted to rule. So here he's saying, well, I'm ruling now and I'm changing the propaganda. Going back to looking at this statue in front of us, it's not necessarily the kind of empire builder that we would imagine. This is quite stripped down. I mean, he's a young man. He's got a kind of contemplative look. He never seems to be meeting your eye. No. No matter where you stand. walked around him a few times now. He won't look me in the eye. But he has these very piercing eyes, which are actually made out of glass. So they really stand out from the dark bronze. That's something that you see on other antique sculptures as well. This is really well preserved with a lot of detail for something that's so old. And the fact that it's bronze is extremely unusual because, of course, not many bronze figures would have lasted from antiquity because people would usually melt the metal down and use it for another purpose. And there's this fabulous story about why this particular head is so well preserved, which is that it was actually part of a statue that was put up in Egypt. And at one point, the Kush Empire, these enemies of the Romans who were in charge of Egypt at the time, invaded, they knocked down the statue, they took it away, and it was sort of like, ha ha, thumb your nose at the Roman Empire by burying the head of the emperor. And cutting the head off the statue is symbolic for cutting the power, the source of power of the emperor himself. And what they did with it was very unusual. They buried it underneath the temple where they worshipped. So they were actually all standing on his head and treading on him whenever they they went to worship. So it's a good way of like trampling him under their feet, always reminding him, you know, you're beneath us. The thing that strikes me about this is he's portraying himself in a very specific way, obviously, and there's this connection to Alexander the Great through the youth and the tousled hair and of course Alexander the Great being the ultimate role model for the young military genius and this is clearly a tradition that Augustus is tapping into here but he's also giving himself quite a bit of dignity with this portrayal. I mean, he's got the slightly furrowed brow, but just enough to imply a focus, not a worry. And that's interesting because at this time when he's creating this new image, he was trying to create a shift in society. He didn't want to be warring, infighting senators, trying to up themselves and promote their own prowess. He was bringing it back to moral outlook down to the individual, and he took the name of Principate, so he's the first amongst equals. And he tried to lead by example, talking about family values and the imagery he took on. He was promoting that as well. And it's interesting to talk about his youth because he used this image until he died. So he died at, I think, 76 or something like that, and he never got another wrinkle or anything. So the idea of the state portrait in Britain. There's images of Queen Elizabeth and they're everywhere. Or We age her. On our coins, we have aged her like every 20, 40 years or so. We should put a couple of wrinkles on and make it a bit fatter. Not so much with Augustus. No. Huh? <laughs> and then every emperor afterwards took that approach. So they could maybe depict themselves as old person, but they would never age themselves any further than their original image. It's also worth remembering that what had come before this was the Roman Republic, the Senate, and the idea was that Roman citizens had a say and voted on things. And this is Augustus, who's breaking from that mold and making it an empire. So he's the first among equals trying to connect back to that republic idea, but also putting himself slightly over it. And this is slightly bigger than life size. So he would have been a little bit bigger than anybody. Anybody else, definitely. <laughs> but he was everywhere. This image would have been everywhere. And it was in towns as far off, you know, flung field as Egypt, like the furthest corner of the empire at that time. And it's a statue actually stood in for the emperor himself. So he would be able to preside over court hearings and pass judgments in his presence in the statue. So the idea of imbuing a statue with a a bit of the personality of the person that it is Mm -hmm. portraying. The power that dwells inside the statue. Of course we don't know what he looks like, but this is a quite realistic seeming portrayal. A man could look like that. He's quite attractive. Very sympathetic. He looks like someone who'd give you a fair trial. And the fact that the head has been removed from the statue by the Kush, they are attacking that power. They're attacking the statue, and remember that statue is Augustus in all intents and purposes, and they managed to behead him. So unfortunate for him that he had his head cut off in the statue, but lucky for us because it's been preserved in the sands of Egypt. (laughs) 